depending on whether Mary Rose wants to call me Dave or Davis. <laughs> um, Vice President of the Friends of Gibson, volunteered by Boris. <laughs> <laughs> and I just met Bill, but from what I've read, he's a fascinating character. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, I can have up to the <laughs> Now you all read the Middletown Mercury? Yes. yes. Good. Everybody? I do. Yes. Okay, okay, good. Aquila. You must be a North a North Lake County. <laughs> so maybe so you're gonna know more about Bill than I do. Other than the fact that I know that he's a lover of history and has contributed items to the Gibson Museum, for which we're very grateful. And all I knew about him was he was Mike Wink's dad. Yeah. Yes. That's what a lot of people know. Because yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm a newcomer. Yes. Um, before we get started, I do want to remind you about three things. First, uh, the unmentionable exhibit. You would think it would be called unmentionables, but it's not. It's just unmentionable. And it is a collection in all three Lake County museums of items that are perhaps somewhat uncomfortable or or curious or just odd. And um, so we've got a case here and some things scattered there and some disturbing things here. Um, but they're worth looking at. And there's a similar, similar exhibitions at both the Lower Lake Schoolhouse Museum and the Courthouse Museum if you might be interested in. Second, what fun we have here so much fun that we'd like to share with anyone who'd like to help volunteer, just in case. <laughs> Joni! Hi, David. Hi! You'd like to volunteer, wouldn't you? Well, talk to me afterwards. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and anyway, at any time we could use help. The Friends of Gibson is, um, is needing, we need docents and supporters. We're having a big event coming up in November, November 3rd and 4th. We're having actually second, third, and fourth, windows to the Civil War. You may have been aware that the last couple of years we've had Civil War reenactors mm -hmm. coming up. They're coming up again, but we're going to try to de-emphasize the gunpowder in battle, which is very exciting, but we want to look at, we want to look at war from a number of different points of views, and Civil War in particular, um, which may also be uncomfortable. But um, we're coordinating with the Milltown Art Center. They're going to have an exhibition coinciding with it. Um, we'd appreciate any support and uh, volunteering we can get for that event, too. The Friday before the second, um, we're going to have reenactors come up in the encampment and we're going to try to get school, school tours because they, they are authentic uh, encampments. So it should be very interesting. One, two, three. Bill Wink! <laughs> Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first thing I have to do, or I want to do, is wish all the mothers out here Happy Mother's Day. So I hope all you mothers have a great day tomorrow and enjoy your families. Next thing I want to do is introduce my family. I have my wife of ne nearly 52 years, Sylvia Irwin Wink, sitting back there. Sylvia's sister, Millie, is right here in the front. Uh, they are uh, fourth generation Middletown girls. Uh, sitting next to my wife is my daughter Judy Wink. Uh, that makes her uh, fifth generation Middletown girl. And my daughter-in-law, Linda Wink, sitting there as well. Uh, and Judy has a son that lives in Hidden Valley. So then, where are we? Six. And, and a grandson. And, and seven. And okay, seven. So, yeah. So. Uh, Sylvia's grandfather and Billy's grandfather was born up on Cobb Mountain, and uh, so there's it starts with that family and runs down the line. Uh, I I brought this today because I I uh, this is a um, tule boat paddle, and uh, I acquired this several years ago from a family in. Uh, Kelseyville, a family that had been lived in Kelseyville in the Big Valley for years, and they, a member of their family, found this floating in Clear Lake in 1913. Uh, so that makes it 105 years since they found it, and 
Today, today I'm going to present this to Moak Simon and turn the guardianship of this artifact over to the Middletown Rancheria. So I want to bring you there. So that's the that's the beginning of that. Now, uh, the subject I'm going to discuss, of course, is Gwinnock. And uh, Gwinnock is uh, kind of an unusual name, if you think about it. I mean, it's like I don't, has no significant meaning in the, uh, in the English language or the Spanish language. However, it wound up being the name of a land grant, the name of a village, the name of a post office, and the name of a modern day ranch. So there had to be something in there. It turns out it really wasn't uh, so big of a mystery after all. Um, in the 1830s, George Rock first appeared historically in Sonoma County testifying in a case against the horse thief. Uh, also in the 1830s, a man named Jacob P. Lease moved to California and was the second permanent citizen in Yerba Buena, which is San Francisco. In 1840, Jacob Lease moved to uh, Sonoma County. And before he moved to Sonoma County, he acquired a couple of land grants. And uh, he moved to Sonoma County, and he met he and George Rock somehow hooked up, met each other. And, he, and uh, Lease wound up marrying General Vallejo's sister. Well, about 1845, uh, actually in 1845, on August 8th, uh, the then governor of, the, uh, of California, Pico Pio, awarded a, a 21,220-acre land grant to George Rock. And, uh, but then before that, Jacob Lease had traded a couple of his smaller land grants for the Calliope land grant, which is where we are right now. This is the mm -hmm. part of the old Calliope land grant, which is the Middletown area and the Long Valley area. And uh, as it turns out, uh, here's a guy named George Rock, who nobody knows much about, winds up getting this huge land grant called Gwinnock uh, in 1845. And you, you know, you just kind of wonder how does all this stuff work. Anyway, uh, in 1847, he deeded his land grant to Jacob P. Lease. So now Lease, who he works for, now owns the Calliope land grant and the Winnock land grant. It, about four miles from, well, the land grant went, goes, went all the way from Harbin, clear to an area called the Bone Valley in Gwinnock, which is about two miles east of the ranch headquarters. So it, it's, a, it's a big stretch of land. Uh, um, let me see where was it? Uh, so in 1850, California became a state, and uh, for some reason, least lost interest in the land grants. He just kind of abandoned it. And I guess it was because he didn't want to deal with the state of California or the government in, in the main to keeping the land because those land grants were no longer were meaningful. Um, so two men named, uh, one named Archibald Ritchie and the other one, uh, Paul S. Forbes, uh, filed to gain control of the land. And uh, uh, by 1857, uh, Ritchie was killed in an accident. So that left uh, Forbes and Ritchie's heirs to, uh, to owning the land grant. Um, in eight, the, the patent finally came through in 1865. And so therefore, Ritchie and Forbes now owned the land grant. And uh, the Forbes sold off his share to Ritchie's son-in-law. Uh, and the son-in-law then, in turn, deeded half of his, his, what he bought, over to the other heirs of the family, of the Ritchie family, 
and by 1870 they were all starting to sell everything off. So, uh, prop. Uh, so some of the early buyers were. Uh, oh, it's you, just uh, not going to stay there. Yeah. yeah. Art Bone, uh, Amo Lalene, Pike Shaw, Jim Watson, Freddie Gibhart, Lily Langtree, Edward R. Hennessy, the Ink Family. Rokina, Pentecost, Mostic, Herman, and A.B. McCreary. Uh, so, the, uh, I, I, I forgot to get, I gotta back up a little bit here because I far, forgot a really main point. Um, I forgot to tell you how the name Gwinnock came about. Um, the, about four miles from Hidden Valley, east, uh, in the middle of Land Grant, was a lake. And the, uh, the Native American Indians have lived around this lake for centuries. And the name of the lake was Weenock, W-E-N hyphen N-O-K. And the, uh, so we can kind of see, you can see where after uh, uh, Rock, who was a uh, French Canadian, and uh, the Mexican governor, they could get Weenock to Weenock <laughs> without too much trouble. And it became Weenock. Uh, so, let's see, where was it? Uh, no, as long as you're lost. Is that, is that Lake McCreary, the same one? Lake McCreary is the oh, same lake. Oh, yeah, okay. it was enhanced by McCreary, but that's the lake that, uh, that they settled around. And those, the Indians okay. that were settled there were called the Miwok Indians. And they became known as the Lake Miwok Indians and even the Weenock Indians because of their affiliation to the lake. And there was three permanent uh, living areas around the lake. And on a map uh, that I have, in fact, I got a copy of it, uh, you can see where, they're, where, they're, where they live. It, it marks all the historical landmarks. Um, so the... Uh, the ranch, uh, A.B. McCreary, by the late 1800s and early 1900s, start buying out the smaller property owners. And he bought out Bone, Lillane, Shaw, Watson, Inc., Pentecost, and Gibbard. So that means that he bought the, I don't know, is anybody familiar with the ranch property at all or been out there? Or? If you go about a mile past the main ranch headquarters, there's another, uh, house and living area that had a, and it's fixed up pretty nice. And that was the McCreary place. That's, that's where McCreary was. And, uh, uh, but about, uh, about 1912, uh, Mr. Dieter came on scene and he was uh, William F. Dieter. And he had bought up the Langtree property and he bought out McCreary and others and accumulated the 22,000 acres that Grant Ranch now is. Um, so the western boundary of the Gwinnock Ranch starts at a Butts Canyon Road where Oat Hill Mine hits Butts Canyon Road and it runs on both sides of the road all the way to Black Oak Villa. Then it stays on the north side of that until it gets past McCain Canyon and then it darts off up into the hills and well into Napa County. And then on the, uh, on the northern side, it, reaches, it goes all the way to the Loran Station and the McKetty Ranch and the Comstock voucher property. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty good size piece of property. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, in 19, about 1925, uh, Dieter built the Dieter Reservoir that's along the road there. And it was all done with horses. And uh, it was, at the time, it was the largest earthen dam in California with a rock core. Now, I don't know, that's just the way it's described. It's the largest dam, earthen dam with a rock core. And uh, he put that in to irrigate the Gwinnock Valley, which was where the main part of the ranch is and where you go down there and you see the Langtree House and all that stuff. And uh, they, they ran the piping 
from that dam all for a long ways buried underground and it was all concrete pipe it was all piece of sections like three feet long that all had to be you know put together and mm -hmm. and cemented together and that and all that um, all that concrete pipe came from the cement works in St. Helena. And the cement works in St. Helena is a now some kind of a shopping, it's across from Ellard's Lane there someplace, and it's a shopping area in there. But during the 1900s, 1920s, uh, it was a, a cement works that made concrete pipe, and they bought tons of it and brought it up here, and that all that pipe and the irrigation line out there was all concrete. And whenever it blew, why well, you'd have to get in there and replace the concrete pipe. <laughs> but anyway, um, so he built that dam and then he died about 1929 and um, his, his uh, heirs continued to own the property and the ranch until 1952. And in 1952, <coughs> uh, Woodland Farms out of Woodland, Sacramento Valley, bought the ranch. And uh, E.T. Foley, his son-in-law, George Jagels, ran Woodland Farms, but Mr. Foley was involved in Woodland Farms as well. And Mr. Foley owned a, uh, uh, he ran a purebred cold Herford uh, operation in Pasadena, or he lived in Pasadena in the Santa Barbara area. And the, uh, that was, that was during a time when people had a lot of money and were well off and wanted something to do, got into raising purebred animals, you know, cattle and horses and racehorses and whatever else. Now they do wineries, but back then they did, <laughs> yeah. they did cattle. And, and uh, so Foley was running this purebred operation down in uh, Santa Barbara and uh, <coughs> he could feel the squeeze coming on, you know, because it was starting to develop and he had... 400 acres that he ran his cattle on that he leased and he could tell that in the not too distant future he wasn't going to be able to afford to lease the land because the land was becoming too valuable. So he decided to lease, to start with, he leased Glenock Ranch from Woodland Farms and he wanted to do a commercial cattle operation up at, at Glenock which is a beef cattle operation. It's not purebreds. It's just the, you're just raising cows and bulls and having baby calves, and you know the calves are the product, and that's what you're doing. And uh, so they needed uh, a manager to run that cattle operation that they were setting up at, at one op. And Ray Thalman was uh, Mr. Foley's herdsman. And who was the guy responsible for taking care of the cattle in the Santa Barbara area, uh, was from Nebraska, and uh, he knew my uncle. And he said, I got the right guy for the job, and his name's Earl Houston, and you know, you need to talk to him about taking over and managing this new project, this ranch. Uh, so, my uncle was approached, and, and uh, on July 16th, 1955, he pulled on his boots and went out and took over managing Glenock Ranch and, and uh, started a career that spanned over 30 years uh, at Glenock. Uh, he lived in the, uh, the Lily Langtree House, which everybody calls the Langtree House. It was just the main farmhouse there at the, on the property. and. It didn't look anything like it does, that it looks today. Yeah. If you want to get a general idea of what it looked like, think about, look at the White House down here, you know, past the bank. That old two-story farmhouse, well, that's what was out there. I mean, it was just an old two-story farmhouse with lots of little rooms in it and, you know, and upstairs and a steep stairway. And uh, so in 1956, uh, my family uh, moved to California, and we moved in with Earl and Dora, my aunt and uncle. And I lived in Little Langtree House when I first came to to uh, California, and I lived there for probably six months or so while my family was getting established, and and uh, we could find a place to live in town. 
uh, living on the ranch was, and, and being associated with the ranch was a really, really um, wonderful thing. I mean, it, it's, it really taught me a lot. I mean, I grew up learning all kinds of things. Uh, so I was 11 years old, and uh, the first thing that my uncle taught me to do was how to drive. I mean, uh, he taught me how to drive everything. He taught me how to drive a Jeep. My aunt used to say, whenever she'd see the Jeep go by with just a cowboy hat in it, she knew it was me driving. Because <laughs> as I'm looking through the steering wheel, uh, taught me how to drive a Jeep. Taught me how to drive all the farm equipment, all the tractors, uh, and eventually he taught me how to drive the caterpillars. And because they had to have this kind of equipment there, because it's a 20,000 acre plus ranch, and they got two, 3,000 head of cattle, and they're scattered for miles, and you have roads to maintain and things you have to do. And so my uncle used to use me as a, as a um, I don't know, I, I, I transport equipment. In other words, if he, <laughs> if he said, well, we need to take this D4 cat that needs to go back to Lower Bone, so why don't you take off and I'll be over to pick you up in about an hour. Because it would take me a long time to get back there to, to go to this place. And, and so he, he taught me how to do that. He taught me, like I said, to drive. Drive because then I worked in hay fields. I drove the, you know, this like, hey, move this tractor over here or run this piece of equipment or do this. Uh, I remember one time I was baling hay. He used to bale uh, um, this is the second crop of hay, and, and he, he used to bale like he'd start bale all night long because of the moisture, the dew, and everything, and the, the best time. And then I'd go relieve him at seven o'clock in the morning, and then I bale till about ten o'clock when it started to get too warm, and then we quit. Well, one time I'm out there baling, and this uh, I look back, and the smoke was boiling out of this hay baler, and the chaff that is built up had just from the friction of the plungers going back and forth and started on fire. And so the hay baler was on fire and I got nothing. I got a rubber boot. <laughs> so I had a rubber boot and I had a creek about, you know, 100 yards over there. And so I take off with the rubber boot and I run and I'm, and I'm going back and forth and eventually I did the job. I got the fire with that. But, but uh, that's just one of those, those little side stories. But that's the fireman history. That's how I got it. So I guess that is it. Uh, so uh, growing up on the ranch was uh, was a real real learning experience. I, I learned that uh, your pain is someone else's enjoyment. Like one time I was. I'm, I'm, pro I'm probably like 12 years old or something, and I'm working with my uncle and another cowboy, and we got this little cow in the corral, and she, they need to rope her to doctor, and so you just never down to a post, and you can doctor and do all this stuff. So all of us have a rope. I caught her. Well, she immediately jerked me off my feet and was dragging <laughs> me around the corral, and my uncle and the other cowboy are going. Hang on, hang on, don't let go, don't let go. You know, so, I'm all the way so they can go grab the rope, and you know, they were laughing the whole time. So, uh, so that was, I was the entertainment. I was also the entertainment when it came time to brand when I was younger because I had, I rode cabs. You know, so they all got to watch me, you know, get stepped on and bucked off from whatever else. And, I was never, I wasn't old enough when I first started to really do anything during branding, except I did carry the bucket. And I carried the bucket to collect the mountain oysters. Because the Rocky Mountain oysters are a real treat for cowboys. I mean, that's, they, Rocky Mountain oysters do not go to waste. In fact, some of the cowboys would eat them right there on a stick on an open fire. So, uh, <laughs> So uh, I learned about hunting and fishing and uh, life and death. Uh, I learned that you have to have an attitude, you have to have a correct attitude, you have to get your emotions under control because horses are tools, they're not pets. Dogs that work with you are tools. That a big calf is a product and what you do with that calf 
preparation to have it harvested or sold is all is necessary. And that includes branding them and cutting the young bulls and the whole thing. That's just, you, you, that's a process that if you're going to be in the cattle industry and you're going to raise beef cattle, you're preparing a product to be harvested and that's part of it. And so you have to get your head on straight about all this stuff. And uh, I helped uh, deliver calves in the dark at night in the mud and raining like crazy. Um, so the uh, another thing I learned was um, burning. We used to burn at uh, the, uh, the ranch uh, a couple thousand acres every year to, because it would uh, the grasses come back inside the burn and then the springs all would start to come back and run because the brush are not sucking up all the water and so every year we would burn about 2,000 acres and we used to build a perimeter around the burn area and then at a certain time we would all start walking you know around lighting off the edges and to burn it all burn it into the middle and uh, what time of year was that summertime yeah. Oh, yeah. We burnt. We burnt the best, the hottest. I mean, we had a guy that worked for the. He was a retired uh, forestry guy. His name was Buck Erickson, and he was the first ranger around here. And he helped us burn. And he'd always call and say, "Okay, we got to burn tomorrow because the humidity is going to be like 10." Oh, and that's nice. when we went and burned. And I mean, it burnt right down to the. It burned the roots right down to the ground. I mean, it it would be really hot. So. Uh, hmm, where was I there? Anyway, uh, oh, I was going to tell a story about one time we were we were burning, and uh, my uncle and I we both had on five gallon back pumps, and I'm probably like you know, 15, 16 now, and uh, we got on back pumps, and one of us had a torch, and one of us had a McLeod. And the cloud is that tool that's got a blade on one side, and then big forks on the other, and the cow fire, the, all the guys know what they are. You go along, and you, you're cutting back like this, and dragging the, the debris back, and then lighting the fire on the other side the way you want it to burn. So, you know, so you're building a little break, and then you buy, start the fire. And so we were, uh, we were going down this big canyon, and uh, my uncle and I, I mean, like we were, like we'd never done this before in our life. We take off down this canyon, and we're over here, and we want to go down here and hit the creek bed, and then go on this way. So instead of going straight down like this, we went at an angle like this. Well, that was a big mistake because the, all of a sudden I looked behind me, and up where the fire had gone, it set pine cones on fire, and the pine cones are rolling down the hill, and they're rolling across the cut. <laughs> so they're setting this thing on fire. So we're over there with our back pumps, running back and forth to the bottom of the creek, filling up, trying to put this out. And thank God, the dozer operator that was working with us saw us, and saw the trouble we were in. He had a big old D8, and he just dropped the blade, and came right down that canyon, and built a berm, and stopped the fire and picked us up and gave us right out the end and that was it. But it was so it was uh, I got I had a lot of experience. Um, the uh, a couple of things that my uncle uh, always the sayings that he said that I always appreciated was he said that um, if you if you got injured, you know, if you got Kicked by a calf, or you know, your, your finger smashed, or a big hunk of hide knocked off you, or something like that. He'd just say, "It's all right. It's a long ways from your heart." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was one. And the other one was, uh, he would say, uh, "You know, if I was whining, you know, about being hungry or something, he'd say, well, no sense being hungry till you get where the food is." Makes <laughs> 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 sense. Yeah, another thing we did was uh, when you're riding horseback, and you know, we used to take a cow drive at the, uh, once a year and drive cattle from the main part of the ranch clear back across Pew Creek and then towards Book Valley. I mean, it takes us all day. I mean, you know, you, you all day long. I mean, you start like it. We probably hit the barn about 5 o'clock in the morning, and, you know, and then we'd get in probably 4 30, 5 o'clock that evening. And, uh, 
he taught me that uh, when you get a little bit thirsty, you just find a dry stream bed, and you get off and you find a little round pebble, and you clean it up, stick it in your mouth, and pretty soon you got saliva <laughs> in your mouth. So, um, so anyway, Foley, uh, back to the ranch. No bottle of water. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, no. no I Very good. Is this, some politician got in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> So Bill, you need a round stone. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's right. Keep one in your pocket. Uh, so, uh, life on the ranch was was a uh, uh, the cattle ranch was a blood and guts operation. I mean, it was you were expected to work at, at minimum six days a week. I mean, holidays and weekends for for city folks. Uh, they did let the ranch hands have Christmas off and Thanksgiving off. I mean, they did get Sundays off, on, you know. But Saturday was a regular work day. But I remember when I was a kid, um, we would, uh, I mean, the cow had to be fed on Christmas and Thanksgiving and everything else too, so that's what my uncle and I and sometimes my sister did is that on Christmas morning, we would get up and get dressed and get in the Jeep and head out to the, wherever we had to go and, and feed cattle. Uh, anyway, by 1958, uh, Foley had determined that he couldn't, he wasn't going to be able to keep his operation going in the Santa Barbara area. So that's when they started to develop the ranch to the, the next point, which was they built that big Buckler building that was the show barn. Uh, that, which probably doesn't mean a lot to most people if you haven't been there, but they built a big butler building as a show barn to, to house their more expensive cattle in and to feed the baby calves and to do what they needed to do. And uh, then they built two new houses. They built uh, one for Mr. Thalman, who was going to be moving up here because they were bringing that operation. And they built a brand new one for my uncle to live in so that he could didn't have to live in the wine tree house uh, any longer because it was pretty primitive. And um, so they got a nice house there. But then everything started to change because you, know, you got white painted fences and pretty soon you got neckties and Stetsons and stuff walking around instead of, you know, blood and gut stuff. I remember, uh, well, I, I, I'm back up a little bit here, is when I first moved to the ranch, there was actually a cookhouse with a cook and a bunkhouse that had guys living in it and you know then there was a, some other buildings and a shop and, and there at the line tree house there was a building for smoking meat and curing stuff and storing uh, other goods uh, the uh, some of the funny that, well the guy that was the cook back then his name was Jack and he always had Eskimo pies in the freezer so as a kid you could go over there and get an Eskimo pie and uh, and they used to bring in a guy from the Sacramento area. His name was, uh, what was his name? Bell, something, I can't remember. Anyway, he was a little shriveled up guy, and he was the irrigator. And he irrigated, the, uh, you know, he knew how to irrigate the pastures and all that stuff all summer long. And, and, uh, uh, and he hated mosquitoes. Well, uh -huh. you're going to irrigate pasture, I mean, you're going to have a lot of mosquitoes, I'll guarantee you. Anyway, uh, when the hay crew came in early in May to do the hay, you know, the, 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 everything was full. I mean, the, you know, the guys were staying in the bunkhouse and the cook was cooking and the, you know, oh, what's his name, Bill, was there running around in the Jeep and the hay crew loved to play jokes. And so this old guy had this Jeep and one day he came out from taking a little bit of a nap after his lunch and everybody's standing around on the other side kind of watching wondering what's going on. And they hooked up a whistling smoke bomb up to his Jeep. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so when he started it up and the smoke started flying and the, and the thing started whistling, why he came bailing out of there and everybody got a big hoorah out of that. Uh, so uh, anyway, it, by the 19, early 1960s, uh, I don't know whether the purebred cattle situation started to go north or south or whichever way it was going, or if Mr. Foley's health was starting to fail, but he uh, 
by the 1960s, middle 60s, he was he was looking to get out of the get out of the business and, and do something with and Woodland Farms, do something with the ranch, and that's when uh, that's when the Magoons came in the picture, and uh, the uh, the, uh, the Magoons, if I'm not mistaken, the Magoons bought the property and fully leased it back for like a couple more years, and then the Magoons eventually took it over. And they supposedly traded a few acres in uh, Hawaii on the island of Oahu for the entire ranch. So uh, I don't know how many acres are supposed to be by the... 35. Is it 35 acres? Yeah, okay. So uh, it wasn't a lot. I mean, I guess, you know, value-wise, you know, I mean, but uh, that was a big... Piece it, of it was land that next to the university yeah, that the water. university wanted. Ah, yeah. Uh -huh. mm. So, money. Uh, yeah. So I, I take a little break here for a second. I, I just brought a couple props. I uh, I brought a couple branding irons because I didn't know if if you know how many people see them, but. This is called the the UP brand, and this was my uncle's. Oh, and that's on the one Oh, oh is it? It looks like the one bottle. Mm, could be. Anyway, that's that was his his brand. And uh, did UP stand for anything, Bill? Just no, no, just the UP brand. Oh. And then the uh, the Boucher Ranch. Boucher Ranch had yeah, this. This is a very interesting right here. This one was hand forged, and this one is called the two seven six. And it doesn't make any difference which way you turn it. It still says so two seven six. Oh. So it's an interesting brand. This yeah. branding iron is totally burnt out. Uh, you wouldn't want to brand anything with this, but it's uh, it's been totally burnt out. Uh, Not today. And I brought this hat just so that I can show you what the uh, the Gwinnock brand was. This white brand on here, and it was called the Flying Mule Shoe. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to get one of those branding irons. They were, they all disappeared before I could get there. So that's all right. Uh, so in the uh, in the early 1970s, Eat Magoon was the uh, patriarch of that part of the family. He was killed in a car accident on the Silverado Trail down by Napa. And uh, so that left uh, the two sons, Bob and uh, Orville, and the mother to, uh, and of course it's a, this is a corporation that owns this, but they're the ones that have got this California operation and they're the ones that are in charge of it. And Mrs. McGoon said that, supposedly she said, to the boys, can't we do something more romantic than cattle? Mm -hmm. And so that's when the winery business got started. Mm -hmm. They planted a test plot out in the uh, out from the ranch there, and just picked an area, and they planted several different uh, varietals in there to see how well they would do. And they contracted with the Raymond family out of uh, St. Lena, which is Raymond Vineyards and Cellars. And they were also the nephews, uh, two of the boys were nephews of Buck Erickson, who was the old forest ranger who used to tell us how to burn and all that stuff. So, small world, everybody gets around. Uh, they, uh, so they contracted with them and they planted these grapes and then they harvested them and they made wine out of them down in the valley <coughs> and determined that it was something that they could do, and so they proceeded on to uh, develop a winery and uh, plant more vineyard, and the cattle, uh, the, the cattle business was slowly being pushed out. Uh, the permanent pasture that had been necessary to, you know, put your cattle on and get hay and whatnot was uh, slowly being turned into the vineyard, all torn up, and the big oak trees taken out, and you know, so on. Um, by this time, I, I was on to other things, and uh, in 1981, the, uh, I knew that what was going on up here, but I mean, because my uncle was still here, and I mean, I, 
Yeah, I knew what they were up to, but uh, Walter Raymond from Raymond Vineyards and Cellars approached me at a, uh, a service club meeting in Calistoga and asked me if I'd be interested in helping him put together the winery. And uh, uh, I didn't really think he was serious because I had no experience in wine at all. I mean, I was in the tire and automotive repair business. And uh, but he said, no, I don't, I don't, you don't need to know any of that. I know all that. I just need somebody to get things done. I need somebody up there to put it together and get it done and, you know, do what we have to do. And uh, so I was, uh, I was ripe for, for that. And so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll go give it a shot, you know. And so on September 4th, 1981, I went to work at Monarch Winery, and it was, we did our first crush outside with headlights, because we had no lights. I mean, and so we had to get by with what we had to get by with. And that was quite a project because it had its own water system that had to be maintained and it had its own fire suppression system that had to be maintained. It had the latest in uh, a lot of uh, winery equipment. It had a refrigeration system unlike most, I mean not, not unlike all, but unlike most. It was a, an ammonia system where the, uh, the pumped liquid ammonia and I'll tell you what, liquid ammonia is so potent that you couldn't, if I dropped a, a drop in here, we'd all have to leave quick. I mean, it is so, it's, uh, so, um, so to start with, we only had a few tanks, and uh, the, uh, over the five years I was there, my job was to finish out the project, you know, get in all, so if you go out there now and you look at all the barrel racks and the air handlers and the, we used to have to climb up on those air handlers or clear up on the top of there, I don't know if you've seen, seen it or not, we had a forklift and we built this little thing go on top of it and we just run up there and climb on it, but um, totally not safe, but that's what we did, uh, and uh, I took it out to that point and it was, uh, the, the, the varietals that they planted out there um, to make wine with were uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec, Merlot, Petit Syrah, Petit Verdot, Chenin Blanc, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, and I'm thinking one other white varietal, but I can't remember what it was. And, uh, and we started making wine. And, uh, uh, my job was not only to take the project forward, but to run the operation. So my job description at, uh, about the fourth year in was I was responsible for from the product from the time the grapes went across the scale until the wine was shipped out to go to the warehouse or wherever it was going. All that was my responsibility. And uh, so, that's my full circle about uh, being at Glenock. Uh, it, uh, I, I, I was going to say a little something about uh, Lily Langtree, but uh, maybe I should save that for another time. Um, yes? So I have a question about Lily because you said the Magoons were the first to plant the vineyards there, or had Lily planted Oh, no, no. Lily, Lily definitely, she didn't plant. Their vineyards were there when she uh, bought the property. I mean, whether she planted more or not, I couldn't say, but I do know that when she originally bought the property, because she talks about in her book, you know, her vineyards, she saw her vineyards for the first time. So uh, uh, the book that, uh, that if you want to read about, you know, the her time at Monarch and, and Milltown is, you read The Days I Knew by, by Lily Langtree, and, and it tells, she talks about how she, her rail car, she, she said she, she was in San Francisco and some other admirer gave her a rail car, called the Laylee, I think. And uh, she, was, she took a rail car and her guests and they left San Francisco and then she said, and we came to this big lake 
Well, that was the bay. <laughs> okay. And they went across on a ferry, and then she, they, they came all the way to St. Helena, and they stopped in St. Helena, and that's where her butler and uh, whatnot met her with the carriage, and they, then they traveled from St. Helena over Hell Mountain Road down the Old Soldier Road into her property, and if you go to Mount Bud's Canyon Road, by Gwinnock, you see a monument on the right-hand side, just a big rock, and it's got mm -hmm. a flap on it, and that marks the old soldier road that, where it came down through there. It's one of the first roads in the Lake County, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, the, uh, so she came that way, so I guess what I'm trying to, the reason I say that is because that means she never came through Middleton. You know, you'd think, well, People talked about Lily Lankry and Middletown and all that stuff. Well, she didn't come through Middletown coming, and she didn't go through Middletown leaving because when she left, she went back the same way. Because it's all it's all written in the St. Louis Star. I mean, the St. Louis Star talks about her arrival and when she arrived and how they left. And then in her book, she talks about it. And then the St. Louis Star again says how. Mm -hmm. that she arrived, you know, what day she arrived and got on her train car and proceeded off to San Francisco. And um, the, uh, she was at her ranch for a total of eight days and seven nights, and she never returned again. <laughs> so, so it's really not as big of a deal as we <laughs> so, uh, She even says, uh, it is positively tragic to think that through a combination of circumstances, I never saw the ranch again. Unavoidably, the two following summers, my work took me to London. She goes on to say that then she made plans to return with the family party that had gone on ahead. However, before she could join them, the railway accident occurred that destroyed her horses en route to the ranch. And on page 209, she writes, This so disheartened me, and of such ill omen did it seem, that I have renounced the visit I had been looking forward to so keenly for three years, and we all sailed for England instead. <laughs> I continued to own the property for a good many years, and at last was glad to sell it for about half the price I gave for it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> like a lot of us in the <laughs> <laughs> She wanted out. <laughs> Bill, she would not have taken the rail all the way to Calistoga and come up over Mount St. Helena with Bill Spires. That was too far out of the way. Well, I guess it was. I mean, it, because it says she, the single lane start says she disembarked right there and headed for her ranch. And, yeah. and uh, i tell you where you can find it. You, uh, Suzanne Case, who wrote the book Join Me in Paradise, she has copies of the actual newspaper articles in her book. And it's, you know, it's all there and dated and you can read it in it. Uh, uh, and she says in her book that she can only afford a fortnight, which would be 14 days, and she was only here like eight, I guess. So, and that's two days we're traveling. Right. So, uh, it it appears that she bought the property because there was a railroad started in that area. That they had was what she about three miles to lay track before they decided it was impossible to light track in Lake County. Mm -hmm. And so she came to, she was told it had been started, and she came to see the progress and discovered it was dead already. Yeah, she talks about that in her book. And, uh, uh, and you know, of course, somebody was trying to sell her property. Another thing is, I mean, she apparently, you know, she was, she was trying to divorce herself from Landry. I mean, and and it was, she couldn't. It was very difficult, I guess, to get a divorce in England. But she found that she could get a divorce in California relatively easily. So she had to establish residence, and that was another reason that she bought. And I think that her divorce was uh, handled right up in Lakeport. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, yeah, that's uh, mm -hmm. But the guy uh, Langtree, when she went back to England, refused to you know, accept it and acknowledge it and all that. So she, he finally, I guess, passed away and then she was able to marry that bath guy or whatever his, I don't know what his name was. Freddie? No, not Freddie. No, no. no, no. Freddie got no. dumped along with him. <laughs> she she, she uh. became Lady to Bath, or I don't know, she would 
So we started the engineer book. He was you know, a younger man. <laughs> yeah, oh, cool. Yeah. So, <laughs> with more money. Uh, yeah. What what year are we talking? What years are we talking about? I, I'm not familiar. I've heard her name, but I don't really know about her. She came here. She she came here. Well, she bought. She came here in 1888, huh. and uh, she sold it in 1906, okay. right around the same year as the earthquake. She sold it. Um, uh -huh. She bought it from a, a, one of the people who traveled with her coming to see the property. I guess was a, actually a. The realtor from Lake County that sold her the property. So uh, I, his name's in the book. I, I can't remember it. But, uh, but those are the years. Yeah, she was. <coughs> and, and there, there's another thing. Supposedly, by like the 29th of May, she came here on the, here on the 27th. She she stopped in St. Lena on the 27th. Got here on the 27th. The 29th, she's, that's when she supposedly sent the telegram to General Barnes that said, join me in paradise. You know, that's a pretty famous, you know, if you know anything about Guanac and the winery project and the, the whole thing, that was one of the big deals is the join me in paradise the, about talking about the ranch. Uh, that was on the 29th. And so I guess she could have come to Middletown you know, because that, you know, somebody apparently sent a telegram, and uh, it was the 29th. And whether she did it or whether somebody else did it, I I, I don't know. But uh, there's not much evidence of her being in Middletown. Uh, even she says she describes Middletown as being three miles away in a row of wooden shanties <laughs> called Middleton. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And uh, so, you know, it just, it's just the fact she wasn't here very long, and you know, she, but she left her mark. But you know, somebody who, who was really uh, greater and, and more significant was Robert Louis Stevenson. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, he, uh, he actually uh, was entertained by the Rocca family, the, uh, you know, the big monuments out in the cemetery mm -hmm. out there, and he ran the Great Western Mine. And, was a superintendent there before he went on to the Helen mine and was involved in the like, cat murder thing. And so, anyway, uh, he worked, but yes, Mr. Wink. Who oh, that's that? another Wink. Yeah. That's Michael. After 1906, who after that? Bless you. 1906? Who, who was the next owner? Uh, I'm not sure, but then by the 1912, <coughs> Dieter owned it. So whoever owned it in between there, I'm not sure. Uh, and, and maybe it was, uh, I don't know. No. Okay. Um, what, update me on Ronald Lagoon just because I don't know, I've not kept track. He passed on. How long ago? Uh, I'm gonna guess, I think it's been maybe two years. Okay. Something like that, yeah, he was, uh, my understanding is Bob is is uh, still alive. He's the oldest brother, but I think he's in a care facility. Uh, I'm not sure just where at. Uh, and this I just I just been I, this is hearsay. I mean I have no. no. Bob is is in a care facility. He is. And Orville's wife Karen is living in San Francisco, uh, but the estate owns the property, mm. or it did. It sold it to. Another Foley, mm -hmm. a different mm -hmm. Foley, and, yeah. then Foley. Yeah. and then it Bill sold Foley. to a Chinese group mm -hmm. with plans yeah. to make Chinese. a tourist destination. Yeah, that's that's quite a plan that they have out there. I, yeah. you know, if, they, if they follow through with that, that's going to be quite the, uh, quite, the quite the project. Big noise, big noise in Lake County. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Any other questions? <laughs> well, thank you for your kind <laughs> attention. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>
you know, wander around, take a look at our exhibits if you have the time. Sit in the chair. That's where well, you did it now. And uh, that was really a shame. You could have opened up. Very sad. I said here, you be like, oh, yeah, I know that's what I mean. It could have been like a fireside chat. It was a bad one. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. I'm trying to get to the fireplace. Only without the fireplace. It's too hot. Too hot. I should have turned the fire on. There you go. Sorry. Don't. There you go. Thank you for no, not. No, thank you for not. Thank you for getting that. Yeah, that was very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I got my horses. You could have put yeah. the They bought got, like 10 horses when the uh, Jeffersons were coming over to raise cattle. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. They lean on the yeah. And then that yeah. fell through because the Yem maybe just went down the toilet. Oh. Yeah. And so I bought two, like, two horses from Red. I know. Sugar, babe? Well, you know, not sugar. So, 